And let's see, how many of you are teachers? Any principals, school administrators, district folks, any policy folks here? Awesome. That's good. We need you. Um, counselors, consultants, just general all-around tech geeks. Everybody should raise their hand. We're at EdgeCon. Okay. We are. And very hopeful. Sorry. Wrong place. Uh -oh. um, has anybody ever done a chalk talk before? A couple of people. Okay. So let me give you the um, basic lay of the land for what this session will be about. And then if you decide it's not what you really thought you were coming for, that, that's fine. You can go find another Educon. Or another session. <laughs> no, there's only this Educon today. Um, so we're going to talk about competency education, and the the question mark in the title is very intentional. Is this how we create pathways for student-centered 20, 21st century student-centered learning? Um, there's uh, how, are any of you doing competency ed right now? Or any okay like standards based. So, so the question is, what is it? How does it relate to standards-based? Yeah, very good questions. Um, all right, I'm still. Huh, there's something I don't understand about the projector, but that's okay. We'll figure it out. Maybe the other one worked too. It was just user error because we know 95% of the time that's what the problem is, right? It's user error. Um, Okay, so we're going to, I love the fact that the EDUCON sessions are styled as conversations. So I have a conversation map, but I, I have, um, I'm ready to jump in any number of different directions along that pathway um, based on where you want the conversation to go. So, Let me see if I can figure it out. I would you love off. if you could see. I'll take a swing at it. There, there's some, I think there's some trick. I tried to coordinate input selection with display detection, but that didn't quite work. So, so basically, we're going to start with something called a talk talk, which is going to be very quiet because you have your conversation on paper first. And that's going to be to surface what our questions are, what we think we understand, um, any anything. What So it's... You could say competency education is, or you can say competency education needs, or competency education might be, or what the heck is competency education. So just surface why you're even in this session through this um, chalk talk, this quiet conversation. So we'll use pens and we'll write on the paper. And we'll do that for 10 minutes. After that, I'll share, and, and, and based on what emerges there, I'll share what I think might be the highlight pieces. Um, and, and again, we can go in different directions. So I can talk about the national perspective and what's happening nationally, and talk about how the field is defining competency education, what's emerging as the five criteria around or components of competency education. We can look at what the um, implicate, what some of the policy pieces are or what the implications are, what the developments are. I can show you um, some specific tools and resources. I've been running a competency-based high school for over 10 years now. And we've developed a lot of tools and put them on the web, make, made them available for people so you can take them, hopefully make them better, and then share them back. Um, so we can go in a number of different directions based on what you want to do. But my intention was that we would do chalk talk, little overview, look at these five components, break into five conversations around each component to surface more. So what are, what are we thinking? What I'd really like us to do at the end of this journey, this conversation that we take together, is come out with some things that we, educators, think are really important to influence this emerging national conversation and movement. So this is a field that has lots of opportunity to be influenced right now. And I thought, what better place to decide what influence we want to have than EDUCON. So that's the basic sort of rough roadmap. And, and 
I hope you're comfortable shaping it with me. So, <laughs> with time, you want to take over my computer and just have some nice pictures. Um, yeah, so there's something we're missing, isn't there? The, the red lamp is blinking. I'm wondering whether it's a, a lamp. I was just looking for the manual. I know, you know he's doing it on that one. Yeah, too. so I was just going to pull up a manual to they, see if it. They could all be coming from the dead lamp room. I don't know. <laughs> um, all right, so with chalk, do you have any converse, any questions? Any questions before we start? Um, let me explain what the chalk talk is. So essentially, the chalk talk, as I said, there's a statement up here. And we're going to huddle around this. There are a number of us, so we'll huddle around here. And there are a number of different markers. I have also have some colored pens. It'd be a little harder to see the colored pen, but it gives us more opportunity for more people to write. And you'll just come up and start writing. And you can respond to each other's comments. You can draw arrows to connect comments. So if somebody puts something up on one side, and there's something up over here, or you write a mark comment, you can connect them. So we're going to have a visual conversation. All right, and we'll do that for about 10 minutes. There are enough of us that 10 minutes should be good. We, we, if we had all day, we'd take longer, but 10 minutes should be good to at least surface. We'll probably take it two to three to get started. So, okay. So come join me up here at the board, and feel free to take a marker or a pen, and we'll go till 10, 10 20 SLA time. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, help me sort of. Yeah, it's not even admitting the light. Right, this one was doing the same thing. Yeah. It's close, and I just get a lot of light with my balls. Yeah, but I'm just going to troubleshoot it and just get it for sure. All right, I'm just going to get the manual with it. You know, maybe something. The same can happen on the other one. Yeah. I'll see if I can find it there.
Not how chalk talk's supposed to go. <laughs> okay, so you're quiet enough. I'm going to assume that the chalk talk's done, at least for the moment. Um, and that's fine. I don't know if everybody had a chance to read what's up there, but basically the questions that are surfacing have to do with um, uh, how does this relate to standards, to standards-based grading, to colleges, uh, empowering students to know who they are and find success and confidence, the relationship to mastering learning. Mastering learning is a phrase that's been around for a couple decades, a few decades. Um, how do you start to build a common understanding to implement motivating students to want to become independent problem solvers? What's the relationship to PBL? Does it connect to PBL? How? Um, how are we aligning competencies across areas and programs? What's the relationship to Common Core State Standards? So surfacing a lot of questions, um, the role of students in developing and clarifying competencies, is if it's too narrowly defined, do we risk putting um, the, or do we risk do we risk creating barriers for struggling students or students who are um, non-traditional? What's the baseline level of knowledge? Is this a tiered competency system that we're looking at? So I think those are the main questions. Um, somebody wrote what you are able to do versus what you know. So now I'm at the tap dance section where uh, I'd love to have my PowerPoint to show you. So I, we have light. That's a really good sign. <laughs> Yay! Thank you. I just want you all to know that's item number three. <laughs> that's good. Super, thank you. Do you want to take these two with you? Uh, sure. Let me see if I can Color is nice, but image is most important. <laughs> so that's what I got out of it to make that work. Thank you. OK, so our colors are off. We don't care, do we? Um, great. So yes. All right, so clearly we're using the, um, the projectors that have a little bit of of uh, uh, non-traditional to them, let me say that. Um, can you see this okay? Do you need me to raise it up? It's basically all right? Okay. So, we've, we've had several other people come in. Um, so just to clarify again, and to sort of repeat there, I'll stand where the camera can see me. We've begun with a talk talk, just surfacing what we know and understand, what our questions are about competency education. I'm going to give you a quick overview. Actually, I have a little video clip for you. Okay, so go to that. Our buddies. I don't have ideas, but straight straighten everything out. No, you don't. Okay, so okay. you've caused me enough trouble. Listen, I don't mean any more. I'm sorry, I'm very busy in the kitchen. Oh, my God. Yeah. Do your do your work. Don't do my work. Put it down. I don't think you're going to end up the towels or something. No, no, smoke, no, 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 no. Oh, come on, what? No, 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 I can't afford it. I just make 20 of these things. I mean, I do all the seven offices, and I got feed. And I got just enough to give them 13 apiece. You what? 13 apiece. 13 apiece? Yeah, seven offices. Yeah, each is 13. You only got 28. That's right, I got 28 dollars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you're going to have to get a little bit of money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah,
I mean, sometimes, sometimes 13 is funny. That's so ridiculous. Yeah, I'll figure it out. What's the matter with you? No, I've got to solve it out. Okay. You have? Yeah, I'll figure it out myself. Prove that to me. I've got to solve it out. It's ridiculous. Not it, not it. Oh, come, come. Why? It's not it. There's no sense to your arguments. That's so. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Now, there were seven officers. That's right. That's a seven. Now I'm going to divide and prove it here. Now, 28 dollars. 28 dollars. Now, wait a minute, you claim the seven goes into 28 13 times? Well, prove it to me. Now, seven to two. What do you mean seven to two? Seven, the lack of what to do, no matter how much you try. We know that. You couldn't even push that big seven down. So, why not? That's why we can't use it, too. What do you do with it? I'm going to let Dizzy hold it. Dizzy hold that two from me, please. Thank you. I'll use it later. Well, what is this all about? Now, seven to eight? One. One. Now, we're going to carry the seven. Carry the seven. We're going to carry the seven. We'll carry it. It's got a little heavy, so I'll put it right down there. Seven from eight? One. One. Now, we're going to carry the seven. 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 We're going to we do use it too. What do you mean? We're going to use it now. Use it? Yes, sir. Give back the two. Thanks. <laughs> Put it right down there. So, see? I seven to 21? Three times. Three times. Seven, 28, 30. Oh, no, wait a minute. Come here. You ever go to school, stupid? Yeah, I come out the same way. Oh, never mind that. Oh, why this? Yeah. Put down 13 up there. Down 13? Yes. Now, you claim that each officer gets $13. Now, wait a minute. Or else I have seven officers? Put seven. down seven. Seven. Draw a line. Sure. Now, 7 times 13 is what? 28. Prove it. 7 times 3? 21. 7 times 1? 7. 7 and 1? 8. 2? Oh, no! Come on! It's not what I never want to touch. Well, it shouldn't come out right. It's not come out right. I don't go on the break. Yeah, I know! Just add. We add this up. Put down 13 7 times. Okay. We'll add it up. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, Six. No, no, wait, wait, wait. Oh, I forgot that one. Yes. I don't want to get that one. No, there's seven officers. Now we're getting it. Now, you claim all this added up amounts to what? 28. Give me the job. No, you take a slap with my right. Sure, sure. <laughs> there's something wrong here. Three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen, eighteen, twenty-one. Twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight. Oh, <laughs> So, does he know his basic math facts? I mean, basic multiplication? Single digit? What's he missing? Missing place value. That's the piece that's got him confused. You might say the process, but the, the, the algorithm, you know, how do you do long division or whatever, but what he's missing is the, the concept of place value. So he no, has knowledge, but he can't apply it in a real life setting. And that's what competency is basically about. The ability to apply, well, at, at my school we say the ability to apply, document, and defend your learning so you can use it in later settings. And there's there's a whole, the, the iceberg, if you were um, there last night when they showed, when the um, president of the Franklin Institute showed the iceberg that's there. So the whole iceberg um, behind saying kids need to be able to use the knowledge that they get is huge. Grading comes in, um, roles are in there, what's the relationship of the curriculum to students learning. There's a whole bunch of stuff in there. But basically we know what we want when our kids graduate is for them to be able to use what they've learned in school in, in, in effective manners, not in manners that will get them sent to the brick, which is where he's going, okay, um, clearly. So, um, I have this as a handout. I just want you to know that QED's theory of change, if we, if we really want all of our students to flourish and achieve the high levels, then we believe we need cultures of transformational learning, where first and foremost, we're creating competency-based learning pathways and learning opportunities. And so that's what we're going to unpack today. But as the talk talk hints at, there are other elements that come into that, which is knowing and embracing each student's strengths, challenges, passions, and abilities. We are in an incredible time right now of explosion of understanding how the brain works. The brain is where learning really is seated in a lot of respects, even though there's body memory and this other stuff. The brain is the seat of the learning. It's what our jobs are about and what we know. So neuroscientists have lots of arguments about what you can and can't apply to education, but they are all in agreement about one fact. Every single brain is wired differently, and we learn according to how our brains are wired. So to think that we can do one method 
of instruction and have every student learn, you know, we know we have to give that one up. So competency-based learning is a piece of getting at that, but we have to know who our students are. We believe that we have to intentionally design for student agency, for them to be able to act on, to use the knowledge that they're developing, and coaching and addressing habits of mind and being. So it's not just what you know, it's what you can do, and it's how you do it. Um, Cultivating communities of collaboration and partnership, both inside and outside of school. SLA is just a perfect exemplar of that, with their many collaborations and their partnership with Franklin Institute, and embedding these practices in laboratories of democratic practice. So our students understand how to have disagreements, how to um, impact the decisions that shape their lives. So these are all the pieces of what, what undergirds the way I'm looking at competency-based education, just to let you know that. Um, co competency Works is a nonprofit organization or nonprofit, um, I think it's a website, but I'm not sure if it's actually it's got its own organization, but it's a partnership of a number of different um, organizations and foundations that believe that competency education is the way we need to, to move. Um, I'm from New Hampshire. New Hampshire was the first state in the country to change state policy, state regs. In 2005, the New Hampshire legislature changed our, changed our minimum standards to say that all students would graduate based on um, competency. So that meant that no longer was it seat time. And in effect, they, the New Hampshire legislature threw out the Carnegie unit which is based on the number of minutes that a kid spends in class and get whatever grade that school deems is passing. So the New Hampshire legislature said by 2008, all students would be graduating based on attainment of competency of course standards. It's 2013 and we're still trying to figure out how to do that. So don't get me wrong. Um, great, sometimes policy happens first and then practice follows. Sometimes practice happens and policy follows, and we're seeing a variety of that around the country. So at this point in time, there are a number of other states that are looking to follow suit. Some already have, some will. Pennsylvania just um, published a report, and it's on, you can get the link from the Competency Works page, where Pennsylvania is looking to go competency-based, competency-based graduation. What that looks like and means, Will, un will play out in different ways in different states. But there are big conversations. The National Governors Association is 100% behind this. The um, CCSSO, the um, uh, school, I never say it right, Chief State School Officers is anyway what I'm talking about. So these are all of your superintendents, the state superintendents coming in. They are 100% behind, I shouldn't say, maybe 95%. Anyway, they're moving competence-based education in some big ways. So there are a lot of organizations and foundations supporting this. So out of out of competency works is how do you say that? There's no apostrophe <laughs> All right. So my grammar is gonna um, not be as competent as, as I would like it to be. But uh, a number of a few people, one being Chris Sturgis from MedisNet and Susan Patrick who is the CEO of I Nicole, the International Association for K-12 online learning, have done some research and reports over the last couple of years saying it's not about time, it's about the learning. And they, uh, Chris in particular, has been really working to pull together these the ideas of what competency is. Um, and having been, she worked with the USDOE, with Jim Shelton around policy, and, and pushed for competency being in the policy. And he said, are we ready for this? And she said, oh my gosh, we're not. We don't have the capacity and the infrastructure. So she um, has, de has devoted her time and her energy to developing that. So the working definition for competency education right now has these five components to it. So students advance upon mastery. Each one of these components, you're going to say, OK, so what does that mean? Right? There's unpacking that needs to take place all the way along the line. Bless you. Um, we know that language is a problem. In New Hampshire, it's called competency-based. In Oregon, it's called proficiency-based. Someplace else, it might be called standards-based. But we will talk a little about the relationship between standards and competencies. Um, competencies include explicit, measurable, transferable, 
learning objectives that empower students. This was a year's worth of work to fine tune these, and they're still being fine tuned. So, assessment is meaningful and a positive learning experience for students. So, assessment is a positive learning experience. Assessment is not just what happens at the end of the learning, but this is assessment of and for learning as well. Students receive timely, differentiated support based on their individual learning needs. We cannot risk further um, losing our non-traditional students or our struggling students. In fact, what we need to do is know them better so we can leverage their strengths and stop focusing on their challenges. We've got to move out of the deficit-based model in education. Um, and learning outcomes emphasize competencies that include application and creation of knowledge along with the development of important skills and dispositions. So a lot of implications in those statements. You know, people are typing furiously. CompetencyWorkers.org is the website. And there's a blog, and they are looking for perspective. We're looking for the conversation, um, and they're putting lots of resources together up there. And I'll show other resources while we're at it. Um, so I want to do a check-in with you. As, as I said, for those of you who were here in the beginning, I'm ready to take our conversational pathway in a number of different directions. But what I have planned as the next step was that we'd have five groups, each take one of these and talk about, so what are the questions? What do you know? What do you like? What do you disagree with? And try to unpack it a bit. Because these are supposed to be conversations, not just me talking at you. Um, I'd like to show you a visual that will rock your soul, as one of my teachers says. Um, and I do have a handout for you. I can't send it to you electronically. It's not mine. But I, but I did have permission to photocopy it. So I have a copy of it for you. So OK, are you ready for this? I think it's way cool, but it takes a little time to unpack this. All right, so this comes from Robert Torres, who is one of the architects of Quest to Learn, and he's now at the Gates, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and he works on a project that I work on that's called the uh, Project Mastery. So Gates Foundation is very much behind the movement to competency-based education, and Robert's background is in gaming. And so he is very interested in what do we learn from how people engage with games and how they learn through games that, that we need to be paying attention to for schools and for students being able to be college and career and life ready. Um, and so this is his unpacking of some of that. And basically what you have, this is sort of the arc through, right? Um, but, but you have, uh, it doesn't show up on here, but this is novice, apprentice, um, senior and master, and it's on your pa on the paper. I'll make sure you get the paper. Okay, so these are stages of performance capabilities, and and what I love is in our school we say we here's my premise that this is high school. When you graduate from high school, this is where you're at, and this then becomes what you do after high school. Um, because our premise is that you have to get the habits of mind and being established before you can really take off with the content. So there's a lot of uh, wandering around, and so it's a little hard to see here, but there's a light gray path that is pretty wiggly. It goes through different things. The circles represent nodes of learning, so different learning experiences. A larger circle, so a darker circle, means more learning happened there, or there was a deeper experience. And then the squares represent artifacts of learning. And so his premise is that we wander around a bit, but but and it's not it's not this. I mean, the, the basic premise in um, in traditional school has been if this axis is time and this axis is axis is knowledge, that it's a diagonal. But we know that's not true. 
Okay, so, so this is basically looking at the idea that we're going to have some wandering. I love Tolkien's, all who wander are not lost. We're going to have some wandering that's going to cons consolidate learnings until we gradually consolidate them in ways that increase our ability to be, to be masters of, to be proficient of. I know, there's a lot to, I'll hand out the papers so you have them too, so. Um, I, I will say that I personally take issue with this first statement. I think mastery is a lifelong pursuit. So if we have to wait until students master stuff, we're not going to get there. But so language might get in our way a little bit. But that's part of the conversation. So if you could do a, yes, that's just what I want. I can go along with it or no, that's not really what I came here for. To the idea of moving into five conversations around and picking one of these to talk more deeply at your table or with a group of people as the next step. We'll give it 15 minutes. <laughs> I suppose if you were this, you'd probably be heading out the door right now. <laughs> okay. Um, is there, and now you're saying, okay, so which table? We've got, I did set up five tables. Oh, five, yes, my math is still working. My math is still working some. Um, so who wants to take the first one? Students advance upon masters. Well, that you said that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but you can say, yeah, that works for me. I mean, so my point is that it's really important that this be a conversation, a critical conversation, a critiquing with toward toward something, not just being, you know, oh, we don't like this, but a critiquing that's productive. I'm, yeah, I'm up for that. I'm You're up for that one. Okay, so is this table okay? Yes. Sure. You're going to take students' advance upon mastery. So, so you want to unpack it, you want to pose questions, you want to critique it. What does that mean? If you're online, you can go to cognizyworks.org and take a look at some of the blogs and posts that are there, um, or resources to see if it helps inform your thinking. So competencies include explicit, measurable, transferable learning objectives that empower students. Part of what's embedded in here is this question of what's the relationship of competencies to standards. Right? Where does Common Core fit in here? Okay, so this table is going to take this second one. So if you're interested in that, come join them. Assessment is meaningful and a positive learning experience for students. This includes that question of can a standardized paper and pencil test assess? Competency? Net. Okay, so that's this table's claim, that one, so come join them if you're interested. Students receive timely differentiated support based on individual learning needs. Got it, okay? Guess what? <laughs> you're either staying for the conversation around learning outcomes, emphasize, so basically application and creation of knowledge, along with the development of important skills and disposition, or you're going to move to a different table, okay? So, have at it, and I will pass out the couple of things that I showed you already. We'll do 15 minutes, so it's a hand-up
Yeah, I want to the of the 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 it's Thank you. 
So I'm just doing a quick time check. You've got three minutes left in your conversation. If you could let me know if that's just the right amount of time or you want two to five more minutes to keep talking. Three more minutes, okay. Five more minutes. You'd like five more minutes? Five more, five more. Okay, five more minutes. We'll go till five up. I Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Y
Okay, so I'm going to ask you to finish the spot that you're on. So see if you can pick one or two ideas from your table that you want to share with the whole group. Okay? One or two ideas. That or questions that you want to share with the whole group. <laughs> and who's going to share it? <laughs> Yeah. We have the last one. Yeah. 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 These are great conversations. I have the feeling that you don't need to hear anything else from me. You could just keep going to 11.30 and you'd be happy. Um, but we need to hear from each other because I think the conversations have been really rich. And I'm wondering, is there somebody who would be willing to capture notes for me? Thank you so much. <laughs> So if, if we'll go right through these and have ask each table to share one or two things, whether they're questions or ahas or, or ideas or what you want to influence. Okay? So yes, sure. so our, our conversation involved, we started off talking very narrowly, I think, about mastery and um, a focus on process or product, and then we started talking about the, the need to maximize have, um, time spent on habits of mind. And to minimize the content time suckers, um, and figure out you know, how to redesign how we get at content without letting it um, monopolize the day. Um, and then we talk about some defining of mastery um, in two parts around uh, the complexity of the task, along with the um, precision of the quality of the output. To focus on outputs, a focus on transfer of our um, our of the ability to do the work to actually do it. And then it evolved into this idea of whether or not mastery um, is really the antithesis of grades, you know, not grade, yeah. oh, grade levels, K through 12. And so then we started to talk about networks and how kids are a part of networks. They, you know, Call of Duty is a network that they have only have created for themselves. So um, the conversations start to generate around, do we really want, if we were to focus on purely on competencies, do we really want a 13-year-old in the same classroom as an 18-year-old um, having to grapple with these things? So how do they create networks? And how do we make transparent for students um, the need to be a part of a network for their future, you know, more yeah. formalized? So that's where we left off. How do we make the need to, um, so that they self-elect to become a part of uh, networks where they feel most confident or confident, or they're able to go deeply deeper because it's their strength zone. Um, and I think that's where we left off. Is there yes. I think that's great. Um, a couple of, of comments real quickly about that. So in, in um, my organization and in our school, mastery is ability to apply your knowledge and skills in novel situations that require complex problem solving. Okay, so novel meaning you haven't encountered it before, and complex meaning that you can't just pull one, one algorithm in. You're going to have to do some real problem solving. Um, so, that, so it moves us slightly away from what, what was not the original intention of mastery learning. The phrase mastery learning began with Benjamin Bloom. And, and what his intention was is what we're now talking about. But it, it got way late along the way to the, the check marks. Um, 
it's also your piece about process and content is very interesting. If you've been following some of the latest uh, research about math education, the biggest problem we have is that the focus on content and really engaging content actually they have found gets in the way of learning the math because the focus becomes on the content instead of the process. And that the process is what's transferable to novel complex situations. So those are important pieces to be paying attention to. And then there's that grading piece, or grades piece, what level of performance you are. So uh, we all know our system, our, our education system, is based on the Prussian model, which is like a factory model. And that's called a batch and queue. If you follow, any, if you have any background at all with, uh, with um, business and, and continuous quality improvement, batch and queue is when you take a bunch of things together and you put them through the same process. And at the end of the same process, you look and see, do they meet standards? This one didn't? OK, you take it back and put it through the same. What does that sound like? That's what we do every year to our kids. Okay? So what manufacturing has learned, like decades ago, is batching queue is horribly inefficient. Not to mention what it does to our kids and their self-concept of themselves and their engagement in learning. But what we need to do is continuous flow, which is just what it sounds like. As you meet the standards, the benchmarks along the way, you keep moving. And that has tremendous implications for the structures of our institutions. Because our institutions are structured on an assumption that an age-based cohort is the right way to do it. And Malcolm Gladwell, like, yeah, yeah, well actually I think it's in Outliers. He completely debunks the idea of the age-based cohort. Because we've got kids who come in that are the oldest and they're always the best. And there are kids in each age-based cohort that are the youngest, and they're always a bit struggling one way or another. So those are important points, so thank you. Uh, explicit, measurable, transferable learning objectives. Yes. <laughs> and I think you led really well into what we were talking about. So we're talking about this idea that um, how do we avoid with this need for those objectives um, people just simplifying it into a checklist of, you know, here's all the different isolated great pieces of knowledge and skill that you need to build to this competency. So, that, and then all of a sudden we think that skill plus skill plus skill equals competency, which is not the case. And so we were talking about the need to kind of like blow up the current structure of schooling in order to make sure that it doesn't devolve to that. Because this idea is not that, but I've seen it happen to that. So that's kind of where if we didn't come to any. There's there's a little conversation here about the relationship to Common Core state standards and, the, and testing. Okay, so so a couple of points is Common Core state standards themselves have performance objectives, so they ask for application. They call for application, but of course, how are we going to measure Common Core state standards? Through standardized tests that are at best a proxy for, but no measurement, no direct measurement of performance. And they're age based. Okay. So there are some challenges in there. I'm going to put a plug in for Grant Wiggins' work because this guy has had this down for like three decades, if not longer. When he talks about understanding and he talks about authentic education and he talks about meaningful performances that whether they're simulations of their real world, they ask students to apply their knowledge in important and powerful ways to complex situations that have meaning for the students. So, so there are instructional design models that move you toward that. They're just not the ones we've been typically using. Assessment is meaningful. I guess I went into that one too, didn't I? <laughs> um, that's assessment. Is this, this table? We just talked a little bit about the, the difficulty and the frustration with assessment being driven by state entities or government entities um, and the conflict that that creates with individualized learning and how uh, we don't have answers for that, we, but we kind of talked a little bit about 
that conflict and uh, where where we can go with it. Essentially, like it's that it's, it's not just batched by age, but it's also by even if you had all of the students taking the same standardized test, even if they were you know eighth grade, seventh grade, sixth graders, they're still taking the same test. So how do you individualize that actual assessment? Just like he was mentioning, how the real world is very individualized right now, and and then how do you standardize that so that way some person in one state can compare it to how somebody else performs in another state or various parts of the state too? And what does that look like? In how and we'd also like, while we're having our wish list, we'd also like higher ed to change. Too. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. So, that, so higher ed is a question that we have. Well, because do. higher ed really wants standardized assessments so they can compare kids. So how do we continue to personalize while still meeting all the demands? So there's some really important pieces in here that are at the core of assessment literacy. Okay. So the standardized tests that allow us to compare across states tell us nothing about the individual. They were not designed to tell us anything about the individual. And that we conflate that, we confuse that, we confuse that in our schools, we confuse that in this idea that teacher evaluation is going to be based on standardized test results. The standardized tests that are at the state level are designed to measure effectiveness of programs. That's a very different thing. They're designed to throw out, so that's another piece, just by being norm referenced instead of criterion referenced, you are changing the measurement purpose. Right? Norm reference means that there's always a bell curve. Always. And if too many kids get something right, they throw the question out. It makes our job a little bit like a Sisyphean kind of, right? Because if we get all of our kids to the point where they can answer the question, they're going to throw the question out. But, but there are other measures, whether it's Ames Web or NWEA's measures of academic progress, the computer um, adaptive tests that give you information about the student's instructional level learning level. They're still norm reference, but the tests are developed in a way that the purpose comes out. They're, they're criterion reference. They give you norms, norm results, but um, to let you, so you can get the criterion report or you can get the norm report. I was just going to say it's not always the questions that might be the kids that are thrown out. And I'm looking at, uh, yes. I'm looking at the failing kids who are in institutions that are not under the accountability umbrella. That's right. That's right. I think our biggest civil rights issue today is the school to prison pipeline. And our tests are designed for that. Whether I'm not saying that the test taker, the test makers have that in mind, but that's a result. So thank you for naming that. Because I don't think we have dropouts, I think we have push outs. Well, you're not categorized as a dropout unless you walk in and say hello and go now. So we raise really important questions here. And the purpose of assessment as a learning experience for all of us is really important. And boy, that's a whole other thing. But technology, so, so when we get to the bottom of all five of these, what we can say that's the really bright spot here and the delightful piece is that technology empowers us in a way that we weren't empowered even 10 years ago to realize these things, or 20 years ago, or in the 50s and 60s when Bloom first came up with the idea of mastery-based learning. We can do assessment now in ways we couldn't before because of technology. <laughs> anyway, um, is it, are there any schools anywhere that, because we do, we go by skill level, so we may have a sixth grader in 10th grade math, geometry, or number two, or whatever, so, or the other way around. Is that possible in a public school system? I think it's possible, but it has huge implications for the organization of the institution. So it has to be changed. Right. Right. And, and there are different, we talked a little bit about this over here, so there are some districts that are doing that. Adams 50 in Colorado is one. Um, and, and, but they're, and, I shouldn't say but, and, they're still working more from the discrete level. Um, as, so 
how we define competencies is a part of that. So we need to do we need to look at some different elements of it. And competency workers can help connect to with some of the other sites and schools that are doing it. They've been featuring some different schools that are doing it and um, doing these things or some piece of these things in some different ways. Differentiate timely differentiated support based on individual learning needs. I've been drafted. I'm voluntold. Yeah, so we talked we talked about several different things. Um, one of the early things we talked about was um, the, the importance of uh, using flexible grouping in the classes. Uh, so whether it's a formal kind of pre-test that you do or pre-assessment you do for each module or unit to sort of see where people are and then and then group them based on their needs. Um, but one of the things we talked about is usually done based on ability, but we also talk about the possibility of also grouping based on interest. Uh, and that, that might also be, that we, you know, ability is usually what's done, but interest might have interesting consequences for uh, this sort of competency that motivating students. Um, we also had some questions about whether the, where that support would be identified, at what level, right? Would it be on a granular basis, right? If somebody can't do some of this aspect of fractions, right? Um, and if you just focus on that, maybe you're missing larger issues that a student has that, you know, maybe they can do well on pre-assessment or don't do well on fractions because there's something much larger going on with them. But at the same time, we were concerned about uh, using uh, a blunt instrument in the way, sort of identifying people for interventions when, you know, they were just having much smaller and more granular issues. And so, the balancing out um, where you identify and how you identify and not having just one method of identifying those students who need support. Um, the other discussion that we have though was that this takes time and it takes um, knowing students. It takes, you know, well, their technology can be used to, us to identify some of these things and to track some of these things. You know, it's a lot easier to have 11 kids, 15 kids, than it is to have 40 kids. Right? Um, and so, Trying to four hundred and thirty. Four hundred and thirty. <laughs> yeah, right. You're high school teacher. I mean, yeah. you're right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. So, um, and so, so there was some concern raised that that competency-based education maybe pushes us um, or pushes a kind of top-down approach at times, which would you know um, plan for a kind of efficiency um, that that would really risk the ability to implement differentiated. So you raised some really important questions, not, not unsurprisingly. Um, one, one piece that intrigues me is we talk about ability grouping as if that's the, as if ability can be measured as a, on a single scale or a single right. dimension. When it may be motivational factors, it may be, I mean, there's any number. So when we talk about um, track versus heterogeneous classes, it's on which dimension? Yeah, of okay. any number of different dimensions. And we don't always know what's causing what. So correlation does not equal causation. Right. And unpacking that's really important. And that's why I'm really glad to hear you talk about the knowing students as well. Um, we just had Carol Ann Tomlinson up in New Hampshire for a day. And um, she had like five bullets she wanted to get through. But the first half of her day was all about relationships. That's where she focuses her time when she's talking about differentiation. Culture and relationships. How do you know students well? Yeah. And technology can help, but only just so far. So there are a couple of tools. I don't know if we'll have time, but I'll just mention them to you. The one that QED has created is called the Learner Sketch Tool. It's at learnersketch.com. And it's a little self-report. Right now, it's pretty much sixth grade up through college or adult. Uh, it's a self-report questionnaire that gives you a report at the end around the mental processes of learning. So attention, and there's, there's elements to attention, right? There's mental energy, processing controls, and production controls. Memory, different kinds of memory. It's not like I have an attention problem. What kind of an attention problem do I have? What, where does that come from? Language. Uh, so there's there's eight different sort of constructs. It's a it's a framework around the neurodevelopmental processes of learning. So a student can get an individual report with strategies 
Um, and we're working to add the strategies for leveraging strengths, not just strategies for um, addressing weaknesses, because we need to do both. And we hope to roll out soon. We've been piloting a place where teachers can get an aggregate view, can look at their group of students and get teaching instructions. So you can see some of those things. If you go to learnersketch.com, select demo facility, put in your email, they'll you'll get, you can either take the learner sketch or there'll be a red bar across the top that says go to results page. If you go there, you can see the teaching strategies. So that's one tool that helps us get some information based on students' perception um, to, to look at how we're, uh, we're approaching differentiation. Um, the communication piece is another thing, and I, uh, we have other tools, so happy to talk about more tools if people want, but I don't want to preclude our time here, but way, technology can be a great way to um, increase communication, whether kids are blogging, or you ask them, so we ask for kids to write at the end of every day about their goals and what got in their way and what they have to do next, and they get a response from, a, from their advisor. And from some, most of them, their parents will respond as well. And they, they use that very, they come to use that pretty effectively to let us know things about themselves and how they're engaging in the learning. But you can use SurveyMonkey or Poll Everywhere or just at the end of a class to ask three to five questions and find out something about how kids engaged in the learning that can give you information to, to help your teachers you know, kind of as bumpers to fine tune their, their work with kids. Okay, learning outcomes emphasize competence, include application and creation of knowledge, a lot of development of important skills and dispositions. You were ready to go a lot of I'm trying to roll down. Yeah, see if I remember what we were going to say. We talked about a whole lot of things. It was a lot of debating, actually, I think. Um, but I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we came down to the fact that if Learning outcomes need to include um, include some more personal elements of of student interaction. Um, could be their their mindset. You know, do they see uh, failures as a way to learn, or do they see failure as failure? Um, are we are we teaching them ways to make connections with things they already know in order to understand the points you're trying to get across to them? Um, and that would, you know, lead to application and creation of knowledge. They're not going to be able to go further until they, um, you know, can make those connections. And then also finding ways to tap into um, the things that they're already passionate about, and knowing that, you know, you can get whatever it is you're trying, whatever learning outcomes you want, if you can allow the flexibility for the kids to achieve those through some disjointed interest that they have, you know, their interest in this topic but can work through a project to achieve the learning outcome that you need, um, that increases their, their enthusiasm and, and um, interest in success and, um, and that sort of thing. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, if you walk around, if, if you were here yesterday and you saw students' different projects, they had learning outcomes <coughs> right? that included the application of career. So they're benchmarks. They talked about their benchmarks. And some of their benchmarks are pretty defined, and some of their benchmarks are more open, where the teacher says you have to include these pieces. But how you focus it and what you do it on is up to you. So there's this, um, it reminds me of the leadership thing about tight loops. Being tight on and clear on what our criteria are and our expectations, and loose on how students get there. Um, one of the uh, additional sort of pieces that's moving in conjunction with competency-based learning is extended or expanded learning opportunities. And what we're working on there is to develop criteria. So with extended or expanded learning opportunities, kids can learn anywhere. But they have to have some assessment that connects to what the expectations were. So what we're working on is, and let me, let me, I haven't said this for a few weeks, so I want to say it right, um, a set of common criteria, common scoring guides or common rubric, rubrics for uncommon assessment of uncommon learning. They're not all reading the same book. They're not all doing the same project. So there's going to be some different criteria that have to be applied, not different criteria, but different assessments, because 
how you assess a paper versus a project versus a performance, whatever, but common scoring. So there are those set criteria. And, and we've developed a set of four. If you go to beyondclassroom.org, there's a website with a variety of resources that we've developed for extended learning opportunities and includes four rubrics that are intended to be just that, common scoring guides for uncommon assessment of uncommon learning and they, are, they look at um, research, reflection, product, and presentation. I'm just sorry, where is it again? Beyondclassroom.org. Thank you. Yeah. And just something else that we talked about that maybe like an untapped kind of thing is like we, we had a kind of a long discussion about like the skills and dispositions and like how does that fit in and like how do you measure that when you're, you know, measuring like content learning and you're measuring, you know, all these other things. But like, how do you measure that they were able to successfully collaborate? Or like, what does that look like? And how, and you know, you're saying like, how do you do that without working 24 hours a day? Like, what does that streamlining look like that you are assessing all of those things and giving opportunities? And, and there, are some, there are some different versions. I mean, um, Costa and Calic have got some great stuff out there on that. We need to just continue to develop. So we're including mindset, perseverance, resilience, yeah. that kind of stuff. Um, if you go, I'm throwing out one more website. Some of these websites are on this little card you're welcome to get. But um, if you go to MC2, M as in Mary, C, Charlie, the number two, school.wikispaces.com, we have rubrics up there for 18 habits wow. and dispositions. It includes collaboration, yeah. self-direction, ownership, curiosity and wonder, problem solving. I'm not saying they're perfect. You'll want to make them your own. If you make them better, please let us know. Um, yes, sir. I, I was just, I'm kind of, I, I think I was looking at this from like a beginner's mind. So I, I was like, a lot of what I was saying was just, I'm, I'm curious, like how would you describe, like how would you define dispositions? And that, I kind of like, I, want, I thought I knew what that was, but I wasn't quite sure. So I think uh, disposition might be curiosity. Right, so you have a disposition toward being curious. So, like in the psychological sense, really, a disposition is like it's not a personality trait; it's not fixed. That's right. It's learned. However, it's not a skill. That's right. Okay. I think persistence is a disposition. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that growth mindset instead of fixed mindset. Empathy. Empathy can actually absolutely be a taught disposition. And it gets my follow-up question as like. How do we make that value? Because we all recognize that those are skills that kids need, but that's not tested on the New Jersey apps. And so, like, how do we change the mindset? Of, like, we have this kind of mindset in here, but how do we expand that? Like, that's also valued in. That's absolutely perfect because we've got five <laughs> minutes left, and we need to think now. about what do we want to influence. Right. So there's an influence that we want. We want to value dispositions. But we don't want to conflate them with the grades. Right. So right now we've got teachers conflating those things. If you're nice in my class, I'll give you an A. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? If you don't talk back, you get an, at an A or something like that. So one thing is we want more quality criteria and value assessment. Let's not say evaluation assessment of coach and training and coaching around dispositions, things that make a difference for the long term. What else do we want to influence here? Yes, sir. Um, this is sort of, I had this question earlier, but it also relates to a, a possible influence. You mentioned assessment as a positive learning experience for the student. Yeah. So is is there any, like, can you kind of like give us like some research to look at for that? Is there any research on like the cognitive benefits of the actual assessment itself? Yes. Uh, Dylan and Willem is the best place to start. Inside the black box, so they've got some more up to date stuff. Um, I think Gusky has done some really good work on that. Thomas Gusky, but there's a lot of good stuff out there. And I still come back to Grant Wiggins. You know, he's got years of talking about assess. So, the, the book that I like the best is um, Educative Assessment. Do I say that right? It's a big, it's big, and it's Beautiful. It's not good, but it's a fantastic, fantastic book. And just the title, Educative Assessment, is education, as, I mean, assessment as learning. You know, one thing that often gets criticized, and it's something that I think it's important to do, is.
we've talked about uh, measuring social skills in that, and I'm a cooperative learning trainer in my district, and one of the things that I really espouse is that you front load things in the beginning of your year. You teach kids, you spend time not worrying more about your content, you teach kids how to work together. You put T charts on the board with different skills. What does it look like? What does it sound like? Um, in addition to that, having kids having a part in what the rubrics have in them. Right. You know, here's three, and this is, this is assessment literacy 101. You know, you pass out, right. here's three good copies, here's three bad copies. What do you want on your project? Right. What do you want to do? And when they really have a say in those rubrics, they tend to get more excited about doing it, get better at it. And people ask us, well, isn't that taking time away from the contents? Yeah, but you're so more efficient because you're teaching that metacognitive piece, and then you're spending less time on the content, but it's more efficient. Well, and it's, it, it's more efficient because that's how the brain learns. So it's not just about buy-in, it's about the processing that is in, that's, that the learner engages in when they are doing um, saliency determination about what's important criteria, what's quality. Those really important um, brain processes involved in that. Um, we're almost out of time. Uh, we probably basically are out of time. I will say a couple of things. So I, I, I know I've thrown out a whole bunch of different resources or whatever. If you missed something and you want to know what it was, let me know. Um, the cards have our websites on them, most of them, not all of them, but if you go to some of them. The, the, if you want a bigger picture of that blue chart, this is our transformational learning model. We're in the process of developing out a wiki with the research the resources, models, exemplars, and hope to create a community of, of dialogue, a community of practice around this. But our basic premise is we need to be working over here in the transformational column, and we too often think we are, but we're really dabbling in transition. Um, one little piece is the white spaces indicate our belief that that's where you need a break in practice and belief. So you need to you need leadership to move you into new beliefs in order to get to the practice, the transformational practices. So if you have ideas about that or want to add to that conversation, um, visit the QED Foundation website. We're a foundation, we're a non-profit. We don't make grants yet, we hope someday we will. But what we're about is making tools and resources freely available. We really think education should not be commodified, that we, we need to be a community of practice and help build the best systems we can for every kid. So thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.